you. Um, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, um, Premier. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this media briefing. Um, as usual, I will start with presenting a few slides on the status of the pandemic in Kalteng. And uh, Prof. Malado will come and present on the predictions and where we are in relation to the predictions, and then I'll come back at the end to just wrap up. So, as I'm sure we're all aware, this has been a tough week for Khalte. We've uh, seen the highest cases recorded in, in, since the pandemic started. We've seen the highest uh, percentage test positivity since the pandemic started. So we're not in a very good situation in terms of COVID-19 pandemic. As the graph shows here, um, this graph really is showing the seven-day rolling average of daily new infections of COVID-19. The orange line is Gauteng and the blue line is South Africa. If you can look very carefully at the first and second wave, there was quite a big gap between the orange line and the blue line. So the gap between the orange line and the blue line was the other provinces in the country. The orange line represents what was happening in Gauteng. But as you can see when the third wave, since the third wave started, the gap between the orange line and the blue line is very small. So this is really just bringing home the fact that Gauteng is driving the COVID-19 pandemic in South Africa in the third wave. So the contribution of all the other provinces to the current South African third wave is minimal. And this was borne by the fact that in the last few weeks, we've been seeing between 60 and 62 percent of all new cases in South Africa have been reported in Gauteng province. Um, on the 23rd of June, as I mentioned earlier, we had the highest recorded cases since we started the pandemic of 10, over 10,000 cases in one day. And this was 62 percent of all cases in South Africa. On the 23rd of June, on that day, we also had the highest number of tests conducted in our province since we started. And this was over 30,000 tests conducted that day. So part of this is attributed to the fact that we did more testing, but it's also just an indication that despite the high testing, we're still picking up a high number of cases. So I'm just showing uh, this graph to just put the first, second, and third wave into context in relation to the other provinces. And I'm focusing on the coastal provinces because that gives us a good way of comparing the second and third wave between the, sec uh, the coastal provinces and Gauteng. So those various lines indicate the different provinces. The black line is the Western Cape, the blue one is KZN, and Gauteng is the red line. The yellow one is the Eastern Cape. And what this graph is showing is what we refer to as the incidence risk. This is the number of new cases per 100,000 population. So it's a very good way of comparing the caseload of COVID-19 across areas that have different population size. So as you all know, Gauteng contributes 25-26% of South Africa's population. It's very different from the Western Cape, which has half, almost half the population of, 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 of Gauteng. So it's just a way of indicating what was the caseload during the second wave versus what is the caseload now during the third wave. So if you focus on the first wave, I think the caseloads were fairly similar. So um, the Eastern Cape and Gauteng were slightly higher than the Western Cape and KZN, but not that marked differences. When it came to the second wave, as we all know, Western Cape, Eastern Cape, KZN were two, three weeks ahead of us. They started their third waves before we did. And they peaked at case incidences of 45 and 47 per 100,000 population in the second wave. But Gauteng, as you all know, we, were, we sort of got off a little bit lightly. And that's probably because the lockdown level, was, uh, our left level three, was implemented just in time to stop the trajectory of the pandemic and allowing us to peak with it two weeks after the measures had been implemented. So we peaked at 34 cases per 100,000 population. So that just shows that the second wave was dominated by the coastal provinces. But those roles are now reversed. As you can see in the last line, Gauteng's um, uh, case incidence has, uh, on the 21st of June, we had reached the same level of case incidence uh, as um, KZN and Western Cape had at the peak of their pandemic. 
So I think what it just shows is the, the other provinces, as I mentioned, they're currently lagging behind. We're not sure where what's going to happen there, but we see we are the province that's dominating the pandemic at this point in time. I'm just going to show two slides to show us the extent of the pandemic. I don't want to go into too much detail today, but because I think we're all aware of the numbers. So this slide here is the seven-day rolling average of COVID-19, daily COVID-19 cases in Kauteng. As you can see, the first and second wave were very similar. We peaked at just over 5,000 cases, a seven-day rolling average in both the first and second wave. We're now in the third wave, and as of 23rd of June, we were sitting at just over 8,000 seven-day rolling average. So it's just showing you know, the extent to which uh, this pandemic is bigger, sorry, this wave is bigger than the first and second wave. So if, if you look at the two arrows that I've put there on the right wave for the third wave, you can see alert level two was implemented on 30th of May. Um, that was just over three weeks ago. Clearly that alert level was not sufficient to stem the tide. Alert level three was implemented, well, the president announced it on 15th of June, but it started on 16th of June. So we're now on day eight, at least by the time this data was presented. It might be too soon to see what the impacts are, but uh, so far there hasn't been any impact clearly uh, because the number of cases has increased. And as I said yesterday, we had 10,000 cases per day. So just the other slide I want to demonstrate about the extent of the pandemic is the percentage test positivity. So this is what percentage of all tests that were conducted came back with a positive result. And as you can see from this curve, um, and this curve is really just showing starting from the second wave, um, in the third wave, as of 23rd of June, the seven-day rolling average of percentage test positivity was sitting at 24.1%, which exceeds the peak uh, percentage test positivity that we reported in the second wave. Um, and the daily percentage test positivity yesterday was 37%, as I mentioned. So its test positivity of 37% is extremely high. And what it means is there's a very high and increasing risk of transmission in the community. Because it means that there are many people in the community who we have not even picked up. There are many more who are positive who have not been picked up by testing. And the thing that's worrying us even more about the percentage test positivity is that despite the fact that we've ramp up, ramped up our testing, and as I mentioned uh, yesterday, we tested 30,000 in one day, we're still having a very high percentage test positivity. So this means our testing is not keeping up with the, the rate of transmission in the community. So that's, that's the big concern that we have regarding that. And you can see the red line there, 5% is what the WHO recommends. We should be below 5% for us to say the pandemic is under control. So the last thing I want to say about this slide uh, is really to just show the table on the right-hand side, which is indicating that across the country, all provinces have exceeded 5%, uh, exceeded 10%. There are some that are still under 20%, but several of our provinces are above um, 20%. And Gauteng is leading, as I mentioned, as of yesterday, with 37% test positivity. So this is, again, a very high and increasing level of transmission in the community. So just to summarize the indicators that we have been tracking, uh, that these are indicators that tell us how, what is the risk of infection in the community or the level of transmission in the community. So all our indicators for more than five weeks now have been showing us that we are at a very high level of community transmission. And it's the, as indicated on the table, we look at the number of new cases, number of new hospitalizations, number of deaths, and percentage test positivity. So in all those four indicators, as you can see, we've been seeing an increase week on week um, in the level of each of those indicators. So as I mentioned, indicating a high level of community transmission in the community. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Prof. Melado. He's going to do his presentation on the predictions and where we are relative to the predictions. And then I'll come back and, and wrap up at the end. Thank you.
All right. Uh, so thanks a lot for having me, Premier HOD, uh, MEC. Uh, I'll be uh, uh, talking about what we are in the pandemic following Dr. Kawanga's uh, presentation um, and what the predictions are, where, what the data is trying to tell us. So as you know, as already indicated by uh, Dr. Kawonga, um, we are now solidly, of course, in a third wave. Uh, you see there the daily increase in the number of positive cases, which are strongly coupled with the positivity rate that Dr. Kawonga indicated. Uh, one uh, issue that we're really very worried about is the spike we saw yesterday with almost 11,000 cases. At this stage, as you will see later, we would have expected numbers to be smaller. So we're clearly very concerned. If the spike continues at the same level uh, today and tomorrow, we certainly uh, have to raise awareness and, and sound the alarm that we may be going towards a second spike. Hopefully that doesn't happen. Now what we are uh, is, is, in order to assess where we are, it's very important to look at the acceleration of the numbers. Uh, how many more cases do we have with respect to the previous week? That's very, very important. So as you know, the spike uh, that uh, that occurred two weeks ago uh, experienced about a 74% increase with respect to the previous the previous week. That dropped to 58% uh, the week after, and now we are at the level of 44%. Now, it's good that the acceleration drops, that the rate of growth drops, but it's not dropping fast enough. And as a result, as you will see later in a minute, due to a lot of mobility and also lack of adherence to social distancing, we are not dropping fast enough so as to release pressure uh, on the hospital system, which right now is very, very high. Uh, so one of the reasons why we are where we are today is the fact that our mobility is among the highest after the advent of the uh, pandemic, certainly significantly higher compared to the peak or around the peak of the second wave. Now, if you couple that with a relaxed adherence or diminished adherence to social distancing, you basically have a situation where the virus is spreading pretty much everywhere, and we will now look at the situation uh, at the level of districts and sub-districts to verify what's going on on the ground. These results are from the Google uh, reports. We also look at an independent report from, uh, with Facebook data. You see the different graphs of the different sub-districts, uh, Johannesburg, City of Tswane, Kuroleni, and City Bank. And if you look at the lower graphs, you can see there's the level of mobility at the level of the district, which is actually very close to uh, before the advent of the second uh, wave, and certainly significantly higher with respect to the second wave. So that clearly seems to indicate that we don't really have, uh, we have two sets of mobility reports that are consistent, indicating to very high levels of mobility within the province uh, between districts and sub-districts. All right, so let's look at risk, in risk indexes to know where we are as a province and the different districts and sub-districts to try to understand the extent of the problem that we're facing. So if you look at the interactive map of the risk uh, in the country, the entire northern part already is technically in a third wave, all the way from the northern Cape to uh, recently now uh, Limpopo and in Pumalanga. You can see that by the color code. So it basically means that every single uh, province that surrounds or that, that, that has a border with uh, Hauteng is in high risk together with Hauteng. Now, we look now deeper into what's going on in the province. You look at the recent risk indexes. You can see the clear acceleration of all the districts uh, in the province, Johannesburg, Ekuroleni, Sedibeng, Tswane, and the West Rhine, but also in addition to the fact that, as we've been noting already for uh, a couple of months, uh, Sedibeng is high, now uh, the acceleration has picked up in the West, in the West Rand, where uh, Ekuroleni, Johannesburg, and uh, Tswane uh, also have acquire quite some acceleration. So every single district is engulfed. So the virus is pretty much everywhere uh, in the province. We can go deeper uh, in, uh, at the level of sub-districts here. You, you have uh, the sub-districts of two of the districts, and you can clearly see that this, all of the sub-districts we are looking at here in the graph are solidly in the high-risk um, uh, area, the high-risk uh, region.
whether it is uh, Ekuruleni or it is Sedi Bank. And we can look at the city of Johannesburg, uh, Tswane. Uh, you can see that every single district, uh, there's some differences between districts as we expected because some districts in, during the second um, peak have had more numbers, so clearly you will have less now. But all in all, in all, all the districts, all the sub-districts are now in high risk. So this indicates that because we move a lot and we are not adhering to social distancing as we should, the virus is pretty much everywhere in the province. Now, the, the uh, indicator powered by artificial intelligence is very important because we know we're on the third wave, but we need to understand when the peak is going to take place. And this early detection algorithms are very important to tell us ahead of time where we are. Now, fortunately, the risk is very high, as you've already indicated. As I've already indicated, uh, the artificial intelligence uh, index also shows uh, something very similar, but it's not dropping. So the moment we see the risk drop, we will basically start feeling the fact that we are above the peak. And that's extremely important for our planning and whatnot. So, so far, unfortunately, we don't have indicators that uh, point at the fact that we have reached the peak. We haven't reached the peak yet. All right, so let's look at uh, predictions. These are very important in terms of planning and to assess where we are. And I want to uh, reiterate here that the models we show are about the worst-case scenario. We always have advocated as a committee that we don't want to give to the province all a wide range of outcomes or possibilities. We want to give you what is the extent of the worst-case scenario. That's what we have always been advising on, and to basically, with that, perform a gap analysis to ascertain where the province is ready for uh, the worst case scenario or not. So what you see here, these are four graphs that uh, give you the data in terms of the cumulative uh, cases, the cumulative recoveries, and in green at the bottom, I'm going to zoom in later, uh, you can see the number of active cases and mortality. So overall, uh, unfortunately, the worst case scenario has materialized in that the modeling of the worst case scenario uh, describes relatively well uh, the data. Now, we have already indicated that while the worst case scenario for the third wave is expected to be less than the worst case scenario of the second wave, that never meant or was never implied that the third wave was going to be better than the second. We always said that we have to be prepared for the worst case scenario, and all the stakeholders public and private, needed to be ready for that eventuality. Unfortunately, we are in the middle of that worst-case scenario. So let's zoom in into the green um, distribution there and compare the data with those models. Now, models are not there to be wrong or right. Models are there to help us understand the data and what dynamics underlie the data. So what we see up until two days ago, the data was actually uh, following fairly reasonably well the uh, green curve. That was the, uh, the central value of the worst case scenario. We also graphed the 68% uh, confidence interval, so basically the probability that the data lies within the central value uh, within a confidence interval of 68%. And what we see that the numbers of yesterday constitute a possible a deviation from the worst case scenario. And this is very, very, very worrying because up until two days ago, all the numbers appear to be following a trajectory. So we could say, well, the peak will happen, uh, say, the first week of July. But what we're seeing now is that as of yesterday, we have a significant jump that now is taking those numbers to be significantly above the worst case scenario. So that is helping us understand whether the situation is under control or not. So as I said in the very beginning, uh, if uh, today and tomorrow the numbers are at the same level as yesterday, we certainly have to consider the possibility that we may be encountering a uh, second uh, a spike. Um, similar, maybe less, but yes, similar to the one we had two weeks ago, and that, of course, will, uh, will certainly trigger the alarm in that we may need uh, tighter and harsher measures to be implemented to curb it. Thank you very much, and I'll give the floor back to Dr. Kawonga.